Uh huh. That's right. So we're here with Kate. Kate, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you today? I'm doing good. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Can you tell us a little bit of what does your job position mean? Vice President of Advocacy at Prison Fellowship. What does that look like? Sure. Thanks so much for having me today. It's great to have the chance to have a conversation about a topic so close to my heart and my work. So what I do every day is I oversee the advocacy program at Prison Fellowship. And so in that work, we have a team that uh, together tries to change the law in our country to reflect Christian values on things like um, justice, proportionality of punishment, treating people with dignity, and really working hard to square our Christian values with our public policy here in America on issues of crime and incarceration. So that keeps me on my toes every single day um, and also I think drives me straight to scripture and straight to the Lord to have a better understanding of how to do this work. Wow. That's beautiful. Okay, so we're going to kick off today's episode with an emoji reaction. Are you ready? <laughs> Here we go. Uh-oh, what is going to be today's emoji? We're going to the Belifo meter. It's running. And today we have the skeptical emoji. Okay, so Kate, this is your idea. Why are you resonating with skeptical emoji on today's episode? Well, I love the emoji. Um, it's such a great encapsulation of how I approach law. Mm. So whenever our team is working on how laws get made, what the purpose of the law is, how do we make sure that there are good guardrails for um, holding people accountable for crime, setting them on their feet again if possible for a second chance, I am always skeptical about things like, are we solving the right problem? Are we wow. close enough to that problem to figure out what we need to do to fix it? Um, is this a problem that the government can fix? Or is it resting on the shoulders of individual neighbors like you and me? Mm. And so I am always skeptical in this job. And I think being skeptical helps. It helps us get where we need to go. Wow. Okay. I think so. So if we would say, I mean, I love that idea of skeptical. Today, actually, I'm wearing my skeptical emoji shirt. Perfect. And I think I'm a little bit like that, too. You know, I technically approach life maybe with, uh, um, I don't know if it's unfortunate or not, but sometimes with a grain of salt. Uh, and we're in a place in a country where the law is very important. And especially like here in California, for example, uh, they say this is the, the state of lawsuits right and i have this job on fridays I, i won't go into details about but it's it's with a very prominent like uh lawyer and he's got had he's got big cases i mean and he's got even presidents visit his home in corona del mar newport beach so i find it always interesting that you know wherever there's law there's kind of like politics involved yeah. and i think in today's topic where You know, this this kind of like, um, I want to wrestle with this idea and maybe I'll go into a little bit of theology and something I've been learning that um, maybe has something to do with this and maybe even my skepticism. So I'll tell you a little bit of that and then we'll move away from theology because I don't want to like stay on like a theological level of this. I want to like personalize it and go deep dive into what it means for us and how this affects families and people like real people uh, living in this country and like I said maybe even in other places of the world um, so all that to say in theology what I've been learning is that there's this thing called penal substitution right so it's this idea that the wrath of God needed to be poured over um, an animal firstly it, it poured over an animal and then eventually that's what we believe is jesus christ right he became the lamb of god that takes away the sin of the world so in a sense when when jesus is on the cross is like the wrath of god like his anger his his need for maybe even revenge and for punishment is poured on christ right now there's there's a few theologians that some people even consider heretics uh but that wrestle with this idea and i think uh, I, i love the wrestling with ideas like this because ultimately If we're in a nation that's kind of shaped by Judeo-Christian values, I think our view of penal substitution has something to do in the way we see 
justice in this nation, right? So for example, this, this person I was reading, and I won't even say his name because whatever, but he was talking about these two ideas, restorative justice versus punitive justice. And then he mentioned this thing, right? And this is like the last theological statement I make, but it was something along the lines, I'm just paraphrasing. He said, you know, God punished the world by loving the world. And I was like blown away by that phrase. So when you hear that, when you hear maybe as Christians, right? Because today we want to wrestle with how Christ followers can be active participants in a justice that restores. When you hear this theology, does that strike you maybe on your uh, skeptical emoji too? Is there something to that? Have you as a, maybe as a follower of Christ wrestled with that idea too? I mean, I think every follower of Christ has to wrestle with the idea that justice and mercy are fully encompassed in God's character. Mm. Now, I'm no theologian, right? I'm a lawyer. Um, mm. But what feels clear in Scripture is that in the event of Jesus dying on the cross, He reconciled those things uniquely on behalf of people. As you say, God exercising His full judgment for my sin and the sin of the world on Jesus and in Christ's atonement fully exercising his mercy on our behalf so that we could have right relationship with God. I think that absolutely is the root of everything that we as believers, as professing Christians, have to say on justice. It, it shows us that, um, that sin deserves punishment, that accountability is important. Mm. It also shows us that we should love mercy, right? And we see that repeated throughout Scripture. In Micah, it says, seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God, right? Um, there, there is so much for us to learn and practice in those biblical commands and in that picture of perfect justice and perfect mercy, perhaps that we could never achieve here on earth, reconciled uniquely in Christ on the cross. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so good. So I love the idea of like being accountable and you even mentioned like this phrase accountable for crime so as a lawyer what does it mean to you when you hear something like you know the law is the law or we're in a nation of laws uh but still like with with and maybe would pair with this idea of accountability so for you as a lawyer what does it mean what does the law mean to you yeah that's a big question um uh, you know i think the, I have deep respect for the law. Mm. Um, law exists as a guardrail on our society um, to help sanction um, evil and support good, right? So, so it's supposed to do those two things. As I have worked in law and gotten close specifically to criminal law, I recognize that all the laws are made by humans. Mm. Humans have flaws right um, and they're enforced by humans and humans have flaws and they're they're enforced against humans and humans have flaws right so at every stage of our our legal process we introduce capacity for error or mm. mistake and so it's really important that as we have deep respect for the law and we understand the purpose of it that we're unafraid of thinking critically going back to that skepticism right of mm -hmm. is this is this working the way that we want it to work are we getting the outcomes we need, right? And and really holding our laws accountable to what they're set out to achieve and remembering that there's only so much that you can accomplish with the law, right? Mm. It, there's also a need for compassion, for personal engagement, for redemption, things of the spirit and that are born out through people, um, right? Not just the law. So it's a complicated thing, but I think it really ties into that emoji of skepticism, right? <laughs> um, how are we sure that the law is doing what we want it to do? How are we tracking it? How are we improving it? And being unafraid to take those steps. Wow, that's good. I love that. And I was uh, on your website, you know, Prison Fellowship, and I was checking out some of you know, what you do and maybe your values, your mission. And I mm -hmm. saw also that at the bottom, you, you, you kind of have like this uh, Bible verses. So you're citing the Psalms, you're citing Isaiah, you're citing Matthew, where it specifically talks about pretty much imprisonment, right? And how um, there was this, this prophecy about one that was to come and liberate people from their prisons, right? Whether those were, mm -hmm. I think we can take that as an analogy or we can almost like take it literal, right? Like being in a, in an actual prison. Uh, we have one of the main 
uh, writers of the New Testament, Paul, who wrote some of his letters from prison, right? And we are blessed by what he wrote and means a lot to Christians and to think that he was writing that behind cells. And even there's, uh, you no, know, he, he, he comes before the governors in chains, right? And he even mentions, you know, I'm in chains here before you, uh, but free. So that's so interesting. So I love that idea. And uh, if you would say maybe as you analyze and have this skepticism around the law and questioning whether they're doing what they're supposed to do or not and being involved in, in prison fellowship ministries, why do you think is maybe what's happening right now? specifically maybe in america that you think because uh, you you mentioned like we want to change some laws we're like actively and proactively participating in trying to change some laws so what are you doing in regards to um maybe what is the problem that you're seeing right now happening Absolutely. Well, I think I lost you for just a second. Um, but I, the there are several issues that we see across the country right now. And a lot of it comes down to learning from what we've tried in the law, right? I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of history in our country of trying to get this right, trying to reconcile. How do we make sure the punishment fits the crime, right? How do we make sure that there's an end, that when someone has served their time, that they have some closure mm -hmm. and the opportunity for a safe start at success? So I'll give you an example. When I think about um, my skepticism of are we solving the right problem, an, an easy, comparatively easy way to think about that is parole. So if we look back into the late 70s and early 80s, what we saw was something not so different from today. People were very concerned about crime. They wanted their lawmakers to take action to address that. And so they tried something new. And that was called truth in sentencing. And that was mm. basically the premise that um, people were so dangerous who were committing crime that you needed to lock them up in prison for much longer. And you needed to make sure that you're specifically removing opportunities to things like parole, which is supervised release, often at the end of your sentence, sort of as a step down from, from prison, right? Or things like access to programming, right? That could help someone prepare for release and incentivize that preparation by reducing their sentence a little bit at the end. So Truth in Sentencing did away with that and it said, nope, the answer is definitely to hold people in prison for much, much longer. We saw our rates of imprisonment really swell during the following decades and then started to reintroduce. We learned from that mistake, right? So we reintroduced things like parole, alternatives to incarceration, um, earned time credits, and, and really started to think about what incentivizes human behavior change. If we're concerned that when people get out of prison, they're very likely to commit a new crime, how do we address that problem? Because, mm. you know, 95% of them are coming home. So uh, flash forward to today, we're in a very similar political moment. People are concerned about crime. They're asking their lawmakers rightly, you know, how do you make sure that we are safe in our neighborhoods, right? But once again, across the nation, we're seeing lawmakers turn to an old adage of truth and sentencing and saying this will solve our problems, right? So we know for sure that we should be skeptical about picking back up a tool that didn't work for us before. Right, didn't keep us safe, didn't have the outcomes that we wanted. And so whenever I hear that about truth in sentencing um, and that being advertised as a solution to the problems that we face, I really want to encourage us all to, to be skeptical, right? Think about the advantages of doing things. Ask people for the information, right? When you, when you talk to your lawmakers and say, I'm concerned about crime, I want you to make sure my neighborhood is safe. Don't be shy about saying, what is working? What has worked in the past? How can we be sure it will work in the future? And that's a really great example of the kind of work that we're doing across the nation, helping lawmakers think critically, examine data, think about outcomes, think about the impact on the lives of people who have been incarcerated, who have been victims of crime and their families, so that we can get to the best, safest, most dignifying solution for everybody. Mm, I love that idea of dignifying people and mm -hmm. finding a dignifying solution. So from your vantage point and what Prism Fellowship is trying to do, 
what are some of those maybe propositions that you have um, versus what you said is truth in sentencing? What are what are some of the you know maybe new ways of approaching this? That is, I mean, does it have a name or is it just uh, I don't know? What are your propositions when it comes to changing some of the laws that are previously established? Absolutely. Well, one of the first things that we think about is is with the sentence. So, does the sentence fit the crime? We call that proportionality, right? It's really mm. simple. Um, is this justice, right? So, mm. there are some really great opportunities for lawmakers to examine things that have actually been tried at the local level, like um, alternatives to incarceration, um, drug court programs, um, you know, other. Uh, probation programs and the issue of parole that we were just talking about um, there are when you peel back the, the layers of data and experience and you talk to parole officers and you talk to people who have either had success or failure on parole what you find is that actually most of the violations that they have most of the reasons they were sent back from prison are often technical So they weren't committing a new crime. They weren't harming a new victim wow. or, or tearing that fabric of society. They were doing something really understandable, like missing a meeting with their officer, mm. um, failing to show up for a court date, right? And then we get into some really practical conversations of why is it the case that when I have a dentist appointment, I get a text reminder on my phone, but when someone down the street has a court date, they don't. Right, And in fact, if I miss a dentist appointment, I might get a, a call from my dentist saying, hey, that was not cool, right? We're going to have to reschedule and you messed up my day, but I'm not going to get sent to prison or jail for that. Right, mm -hmm. So there are some really practical solutions, some really kind of big picture solutions about sentencing and proportionality. And then we also support a lot of things that improve the culture inside of prisons. So mm. what, how do we make sure that people have access to good programming? And um, Because prison is a community, right? It, it can be mm. a community that is safe and healthy and productive, wow. or it can be a community that's unsafe and that has a lot of risk and that sets people up to, be, um, to have less success when they're coming out. And then we also do a lot of work thinking about what does it look like when someone's punishment is over? Mm. When on the books we have said you've done your time, you've paid your debt, now welcome back to the community. What we have found is that when people with a criminal record um, are ready for their, their next step forward, they actually face 44,000 just documented legal restrictions, things like Um, not being eligible to vote, not being eligible for careers, right? A lot of people who are um, stuck under an artificial ceiling because of their worst mistake, which they have paid for, right? And the government has said, you've satisfied this debt. And now the, the most that they can achieve is to get an entry-level position um, without the opportunity to build stability, wealth, rootedness in their community and give back in the ways that we know are so important to safety and to success for flourishing communities. These are the things that, that we think a lot about, things like occupational licensing reform, access to driver's license, um, employment, working with employers to, to help them have a good, strong understanding of what is the risk actually, how to mitigate liability, and what is the value of having someone who's um, really been transformed and is ready to take on something new. So that's a really quick flyover of a huge amount of work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Prison Fellowship works on legislation in, in currently six states and on the Hill. We've been doing this for um, about 50 years. And so we've worked on a lot of dish different issues. Um, but those are just a few of the examples of really salient points forward that we present to lawmakers. Wow. So Matthew 25, 34 through 40 says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. 
I was in prison and you came to visit me. Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And so that that's so impactful and powerful. And now I'm going to personalize it. And it's, well, I'm going to personalize it with a story I know of, or maybe a couple stories, and then maybe even my own story. So first, I grew up in Mexico in Guadalajara, and I was a part of a prison ministry out of our you know, home church. We would go and visit uh, people incarcerated. I think I went, I don't know if I'm, I'm trying to remember because it was a long time ago. But uh, if I remember right, I went to like the women's prison a few times and the, the like the juvenile prison a few times. I never went to like the, the grown up man prison. But we did that type of ministry because there was one person who was redeemed from sentencing. He was in prison, incarcerated. He grew up in the streets, uh, ended up, you know, committing crimes, ended up in jail. Then somehow, you know, pe people doing prison ministry went in. He received the message of Christ and was saved. And miraculously, he was let out you no know, sooner than his sentence was. And then he became a preacher to the to the prisons, right? And his name was Hilario, which is, is amazing because his name means uh, that who laughs, right? Or that who brings laughter, like hilarious. And, mm. and it's so cool to see how a life was transformed so much that he did exactly this. And he did it because he read a verse like the one I just read. And he said, well, Jesus said that because I was in prison and you visited them, you visited Jesus. So he made it his mission in life. Uh, he passed away maybe two or three years ago. It was actually during like the COVID uh, times. Uh, but his ministry just really, really touched my life. I met him a few times when I was here in the U.S. And all that to say, I mean, here's a person who was incarcerated himself. And now he understood the message that because he is now free, and free even while he was still incarcerated, he, he found freedom in Christ, right? We could say that. And he became an ambassador of hope to all these people and all these you know, different yeah. um, prisons in our region. He even went, I mean, he went to like all of them, all across Mexico. He visited all of them and he was part of other ministries, right? Doing that. So that is just so impactful in my life then later on i'm just going to say i'm not going to go into many details but uh to this day i'm still in a process to become legal in the u.s so you can you know take that as it is <laughs> and yeah. you know take a wild guess at what my situation is here but all that to say i feel like part of me resonates so much with maybe breaking of the law right and and where that can lead you and for sure consequences and for sure accountability like I, I've been here 18 years and I'm still kind of like paying <laughs> in, in a sense like paying my dues because you know I, I crossed a way I shouldn't have or something like that right I'm not going to go into details but anyways I'm here and I've learned of this story. This is the third story I'm going to say where it's personal and then I'm going to go to like, why is this personal to you, right? And again, I'm not going to go into too many details, but there's there's a person in our, in our community and she's a woman who had three sons. Now, one of these sons, uh, when he was in college, he went to live in Colorado at college and then he was involved in a collision with um, a guy escaping in a car so got into a car accident and this woman's son died okay mm -hmm. so this this kid who was 16 years old was sentenced to like 48 years in prison right so he's still paying his dues he's still in prison to this day uh, but what's incredible about this story is that this woman actually started to be in in, in touch with 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 the person that basically killed her son and learned his story, learned, you know, kind of like why he got into that, you know, not not really good uh, parenting around him, hanging with the wrong crowd. Now he he thinks back, you know, and he's, I mean, he's super regretful about what happened. And and he said, you know, if I would have hung out with, with a guy more like your son, maybe I wouldn't be in this situation now, right? And now he's a, a full convert 
within the prison uh, system where he now ministries to other people right and he's been there for like 18 years and to think that he's still gonna go another 30 right but even to have this connection to the to the woman who's basically he his um his actions damage her on a personal level but for her to in a sense kind of like come and forgive him and be in a relationship with him uh that's i mean that to me is faith right mm -hmm. but that's also an example of kind of what you're saying you know the the law is the law we need to be held accountable but at the same time here's a almost like a perfect example of someone who's been somewhat or, or fully i don't know how, how you would see it but like restored mm -hmm. and even free even though he's still in prison right so why is i mean those are like three personal stories of mine why is this maybe important to you on a personal level kate like why 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 does the law matter so much to you is there a story like that in in your own journey well first thank you for sharing that you know i found um in speaking with people across the country in all sorts of positions right um, whether it's somebody on the street a, an uber driver um, often people will ask me what i do um right it, it could be someone like that all the way up to a member of congress right mm -hmm. i have found that almost without fail everyone has some story of impact with the criminal justice system mm -hmm. it's just so uncommon that people feel comfortable to share that with someone and so the the invitation of knowing what i do is often um, what leads them to open up and to share about that and and i'm always so grateful uh, because i recognize that it it can be a challenge and um, so thank you for that and for myself you know i think there are a couple of things that have drawn me to this issue the first is that from the get-go in my life, I was raised in a Christian home. I um, very early in my life came to a saving knowledge of Jesus and began a relationship with him. And I'm so grateful for parents who, who surrounded me with scripture and led me in that direction. Very early, I wanted to be intentional. I don't like frivolous things, um, right? I, I like to make sure that if I'm going to put in the effort that it's going to count. And so when I was looking at a career path, thinking about what I was going to do, I wanted to know that what I was going to spend my time on was going to be worthwhile. And um, I thought that would be something in, in uh, child advocacy, um, adoption law, those were the things that I was really drawn to. People who I knew were vulnerable and needed help. I just wanted to be really clear on that. And then I, the first job I got as a lawyer was as a magistrate in Virginia. And so in that job, I was um, sitting behind a desk for 12 hours at a time every time I was on duty. And I was the, the sole person for that time in charge of making decisions on criminal justice issues that were right in front of me. Things like, is there a probable cause to arrest this person? Um, should this warrant be issued? Does this person need to be committed to a hospital? Um, for a temporary hold against their will, right? And that led me to interact daily, hourly, sometimes minute by minute with law enforcement, with people who were accused of a crime, with their families in the lobby, right? With um, victims and often right in the moments following the worst decisions of their lives. Mm. And that was my crash course. You know, I went from someone who had never really been exposed to the criminal justice system, who knew it in a cerebral way, learned it in law school, could take an exam on it, right, to really understanding the way that it impacts people. And every day as I sat in that chair, I missed out on the opportunity to pair up the, the realities of people's experience with good problem solving and the reality of Jesus and the hope that he offers. And so this work at Prison Fellowship has been the first time that I've been able to pair those things together. I'm really wanting my work to matter, to know that it matters to the Lord, to know that um, our, our Lord is clear in scripture that he identifies with the least and the lost, right? And, and throughout scripture over and over again, you see the picture of people who are in prison, 
right? You see that in the story of Joseph, right, who mm-hmm. was incarcerated, wrongly accused, right? And and that was used for God's good plan. Um, you see God holding his people accountable through the prophets in the Old Testament saying, you know, your beautiful sacrifices don't mean much to me if you don't actually act justly in your community, right? This, I, I'm not taking that sacrifice because I see how you treat people, how you do, do wrong to people. And you see it in the life of Jesus who stood trial, was wrongly accused, suffered unto death, and the first person who he offered um, belief in eternal life was a, a thief on the cross. Mm. Right. And wow. so um, those are things that are personal and are motivating to me. And the last thing I'll add to it is just like you, um, I have close relationships with people who have committed crime, people who have been victims of crime. Um, I try to go and visit our program participants in prisons as often as I can to remember that they are people with potential who Mm. take ownership of their mistakes, who uh, are ready to be transformed and to take new steps into a new life. Um, And that is one of the most poignant pictures of the redemption that we as believers experience at the foot of the cross that I've ever encountered. And it's just a joy to have the opportunity to do that work. Wow. That is so profound. Thank you for sharing and personalizing this. And it's an epic journey. I mean, being a magistrate in Virginia and, and almost like what you're saying is when you were there, it was a crash course because it, it wasn't it wasn't moving maybe into the problem solving part of it. And and that's kind of problematic. Right. So I'll, I'll kind of like say another thing about um, kind of like my situation. <laughs> where I'm still like in this in this process of you know becoming at least somewhat of a you know legal resident of the United States. Uh, so this process has been really long, but in 2017 we received one of the first uh, denials of of our petition. And the other day, you know, I'm married with my wife for like 16 years, and she had a dream. And I mean, this kind of like maybe even stepping into kind of like Joseph and, and you know, the like you mentioned, Joseph uh, wrongly accused and being in jail and sentenced and uh, having these dreams and visions, right? So anyways, she had a dream and it was kind of like about these people in charge of our of our papers in a sense, right? Just for people to understand like simply. And it was almost like when they get our case this person reviews it and is like I don't believe it tosses it and then moves on to the next one right so I don't know if that's exactly what's happening but I feel like that happens right it's almost like a callousness to that can be happening to people that are in this system even the people that review cases on a day by day basis because I I feel like some of them might be super skeptical about the case they're viewing right so it's almost like up to them to decide the fate of these people and 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 for some it might be like i don't believe this let's move on for some of them it might be like uh i don't know maybe they're angry that day and they feel like today i really want to punish you know this case that's here and that's what i'm gonna do so it felt it felt very vulnerable to be in that situation and my wife said all that we can do is to pray for the person that's going to review our upcoming case right Mm -hmm. like i feel like we need to be in fasting and praying because when they when they get our case we don't want to be just like another another paper right we we want to be a face and and real and for them to know like you're you're affecting a family you're affecting like an entire community maybe even right uh by your decision you're about to make right now so that's super personal and i feel like that requires maybe for us even to pray for those people in those positions because i would assume it's hard right like you said being Mm -hmm. in a magistrate and no hearing from victims hearing from uh you know perpetrators hearing from just all kinds of sides right and and to make a decision and to be able to to discern even to have the holy spirit in you and say 
this is how we should act. I mean, no wonder it's 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 hard, right? It's a, it's a tough place to be. Um, so, do have you experienced any of that? Maybe even callousness uh, in in the people around you, in the people that kind of like, mm, yeah, like belong to this system. Is that real? I mean, is my wife having this dream? Is that some? Does it have some truth to it? What I can say for sure is that every single human heart is prone to callous, mm. right? I know it in my own heart, right? I, I often um, recognize that I have blind spots to my own sin, um, things that I think are less worrisome because they're the things I'm prone to. Right, that's its own form of callous, right? And I think it's just the human condition. We can, if we're not careful, we can develop hardened places in our hearts in the way we view others. And this is perhaps the most important underlying piece with how we do business when we develop law, how we think about the criminal justice system. If we could just focus on one thing that would be purely transformative, it would be helping each other as human beings who are prone to calloused hearts mm -hmm. to remember that every person was handmade by God with dignity and value and potential for change. So do I think that people in decision in positions of decision making or power might get calloused or, or move into habits of shuffling papers? Absolutely. Um, I think any person in any position can develop those things. And I think that's why scripture has so many reminders to us. Um, I think of in scripture where it says, uh, create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a steadfast spirit within me, or turn my heart of stone to a heart of flesh, mm. right? These are the kind of things that when we pray for our own hearts, when we petition the Lord to change the hearts of others, um, you know, The Bible tells us to pray for those in authority over us, to pray for our leaders, right? For common grace, for soft hearts. Um, these are some of the realities of being just a human person on earth, right? And it, it also reminds me of the importance of having good laws, right? Mm -hmm. Those guardrails to human behavior. What you want is enough of a guardrail for someone like me, someone who's a magistrate, right, back in the day, to say, even on my worst day, I'm constrained by the law to do what's right. Mm. So I had specific questions that I had to ask and answer, and I was accountable to those things, right? Accountable to my boss, accountable to my judicial record, accountable to the constituents in the area, and to people's lives, right? And so hopefully, as we develop those good guardrails, we're putting them in the right places so that we can have the kind of one-two punch of saying, we have good laws to constrain that people on their worst day aren't skewing what's right. And we also have access to an almighty God who can supernaturally soften hearts, mm -hmm. right? And we should be doing both. We should be advocating for good guardrails in our legal system, and we should be um, praying for God to soften our hearts and the hearts of people around us every single day. So good. Okay, so my takeaway, and there's many, <laughs> there's plenty of takeaways on today's episode, but uh, one of them would be, people have potential to take ownership mm. i love that idea and um i mean just so good and when you mention guardrails i think that's so important because it's, it's almost like you're saying yeah the law is the law but the guardrails we can kind of change them and adapt them to to benefit us as community and not just to benefit the system itself right so mm -hmm. i love that because i think that creates better healthier communities right where we can hold crime accountable but at the same time help uh, like involve this restorative justice and i think that's that's totally the lord and god and i almost like i actually i commend you for the work you're doing because mm -hmm. it's it's amazing it's beautiful and i think god placed you there what a great heart you know i'll pray for your for your heart to continue to be softened before mm -hmm. him and and to be continuing in in that journey of what God has for you and maybe to even awaken other people around you by the way you live to to wake them up right and maybe to to aspire to have 
to go from like you said the heart of stone to a heart of flesh and that's the supernatural power that god can do so i love that so let's go over to our last section of the show which is going to be our emojis okay so we're going to walk through the five emojis and you can think either summarizing the episode or thinking of the future we're going to walk through the five ideas so what is the most blasphemous idea you think we have in the maybe even the prison system right now thinking of uh, the worst idea out there i think it comes to being rooted in a, a bad understanding of what it means to be made by a creator with dignity and value the worst idea is when we forget the value of people mm. Skeptical? What are you still skeptical of or where do you see skepticism? I will always stay skeptical asking, are we solving the right problem? Are we close enough to the problem to understand the solution? Is this a problem that the government needs to solve or is it on us around our dinner tables and our communities and our churches to step up? So good. Inspire emoji, where do you see hope? I see hope in people who display moral courage in a hard political and cultural moment. And whether that's lawmakers and their staff who take up causes that are not politically winnable because they're the right thing to do, or people who have experience with crime and incarceration who share their stories so that minds and hearts will be changed. And that gives me a whole lot of hope. A holy idea according to Kate Tremble. I think practicing the one another's of scripture and loving and honoring people in the way the Bible commands, that's pretty otherworldly, pretty holy. And finally, divine emoji. What is the highest idea, the most divine idea you can think of? The most divine idea I can summon up is the picture painted in Revelation of people from every single tribe and tongue and nation, every background, every mistake, every flaw, every sickness, every bit of pride who have been reconciled to Jesus through Jesus and are forever united in praising him. I can't wait for that. my friends that's the end of the episode i would love for you to give us your comments why do you guys think about this episode did you resonate do you have any personal stories you want to share you can leave us comments you know we're everywhere on spotify apple podcast roku tv christian podcast uh we're on our website christianpodcast.com we're on facebook we're on youtube we're everywhere okay so um leave us some comments leave us positive reviews only otherwise go listen to something else move on move away i don't want you <laughs> but kate uh where would you want to point people to to find more about the work that you do maybe your website or your socials uh, to yes, find you yes you can find us at www.prisonfellowship.org or on x formerly twitter on the handle at justice reform love it Alright my friends, we'll see you on the next one. Yeah, 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 yeah.